accept the meetings from our the minutes from our meeting of July 6th. Okay. Put in for a second. Bill, go ahead. Uh, 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 I'll second the motion to accept the minutes. And all in favor? Bill, aye. Aye. This is Mary, aye. Okay. Aye. All right, so adjustments to the agenda would be the warrants or orders and Phil's going to have something a bit later. So uh, does anyone have questions about the warrants? Bill, you had something. Uh, I had a question about yeah. the elevator, whether it was ongoing maintenance or repair. And, and as I understand it, it was actually more maintenance as well as a repair to bring it up to technical specifications. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. No. We have, this, have a, a motion to accept these. I'll move that we accept the warrants as presented. I'll second that. Okay. Mary. And no other discussion. We'll vote on that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Phil, yes. Aye. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So now uh, we will open up a, a short period of time, depending on how many questions we have for public comments. And I wanted to make a, a short statement regarding the listserv before we get started. Um, it has um, come to my attention that there's been some quite a bit of discussion concerning the intersection and with, with an upcoming um, vote in August that's very important for this for, uh, for the town uh, I am concerned that people should be looking for uh, good information based on facts and not not on hearsay there seems to be quite a bit of inaccurate information on those, sir, especially concerning financing and uh, some what I would call half truths and uh, some accusations. We don't, we certainly don't like to hear accusations. And so I would urge everyone to be very careful in what they say and how they listen and to follow the, uh, Dave put something uh, very important on the listserv uh, a couple of weeks ago, advice as to how to inform yourselves about the intersection. And if people would please refer to that advice, they could um, pretty much answer all their questions, uh, I believe. So uh, that's, that's what I have to say. Um, so, I guess we're open to uh, public comments if someone has something they want to bring up. Gordon, before you get too far, uh, hold on. Yes. Did I hear Jacob Holmes on that uh, phone number 3562732? And he may need to dial uh, or hit star six. <clears throat> We got one person on the phone at 802-356-2732. Can you hit star six and, and let us know your name, please? Hello? Yep. Hello? Yes, your name, please? Uh, Jacob Holmes. Okay, good, thank you, Jacob. That's all we needed. Oh, she got a comment. Okay. Uh, no, I just barely joined in. Okay. All right, we're good, Gordon. Sorry. All right. So we've got a few minutes here and some public comments. We would like to hear them.
Gordon, this is uh, Chuck Duncan. Yes, Chuck. I have a question about the uh, utility part of the project on the intersection. My question is, has the town retained to assist in determining that the cost of the utility project is fair and accurate? Dave, uh, I could barely hear him, but I don't know if you heard that question or not. Chuck, you're in you're in and you're in and out, Chuck. Okay, let me try and repeat. Who has the town retained to assist in determining that the cost of the proposed utility project is fair and accurate? So I Dave. Yeah, I can go ahead and answer. Uh, it is comment period, but I'll take any questions, I guess. Uh, so this is put together by um, two groups, one Green Mountain Power themselves, uh, including the four other utilities involved as to what their man hours would take. Uh, and then anything that would be our responsibility um, was taken care of by our engineering firm, VHAB. And they have uh, folks that do estimating uh, based upon recent projects and and uh, materials and etc uh, so it was a joint effort between our engineering firm and the five utilities involved all right thanks uh, can you tell who is they, who is bhab again uh vinas i can never remember the middle one and ruling uh out of uh, they're they're New England wide. Chuck, I'd have to email you the exact um, partners involved in the in the engineering firm. Oh, that would be great. Thanks. Well, if we're not going to get any comments. We can move along, right? Uh, Dave, this is Chuck Benson again. Yep. I see in future business there is a discussion of, uh, let me just get to it here. Do you have a proposed cost of repair on both Clay Hill Road and the Mayso Convert that the town is going to have to bear for any changes that have happened? So the Mayso Convert uh, at the moment is running at a budget of about 160000 uh, We're about 12.5% of that will need to um, Take ownership of 10% of that's 16 grand, so it'll run around a little over 16 grand. I believe we budgeted 16 grand in this year's budget um, for the local share of that. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Uh, the Clay Hill culvert uh, is, or actually, it's not culvert; it's just a washout. Um, too early to tell, but um, based upon some preliminary estimates um, from Vermont Agency of Transportation. That could be upwards of 26,000, which we'll need to absorb in this year's highway operating budget uh, as we proceed forward. And like with uh, the Bay Hill, where the road got closed, do you anticipate that over on Clay Hill that the rest, the remaining section is in jeopardy of collapse? So and this will be in the uh, town manager update towards the um, towards the end, but um, we uh, expect to shore up the side that has slid. Uh, we think that we can do that. We think the other side is uh, stable. Uh, we expect to use two foot stone um, at the base and kind of build up from there. Uh, it won't be easy, but um, we don't think that we're going to need to. Um, you know, it didn't damage the culvert, so that was a good thing. So it wasn't quite as um, 
as bad as we were anticipating. Still not good. Uh, still will be a you know semi decent major project, but um, you know I don't think it was. It certainly is not a Mace Hill culvert type issue. The culvert itself. The, cu the culvert itself seems appears to be okay. Thanks. Do you anticipate any repairs on Bowers Road? Uh, not this year. Uh, other than some, other than hot patch uh, that we've done in some of those places that are pretty bad, um, we'll probably do hot patch there again. But uh, I don't anticipate doing Bowers Road this this season. Thank you. Well, why don't we move along with the meeting? That's it. So the next thing up would be the uh, considerations of um, how better to use um, the classroom out the outdoor classroom on the 17 acres. And I realize that Christine is at our meeting, so that's good. Maybe she can tell us what what they have in mind uh, with the COVID, I believe, with the COVID um, uh, situation that is making it very difficult to open the schools that they feel if they can do more outside, that will be a step in the right direction. So, Christine, are you there? I'm here, yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me um, and giving me time to come. To your meeting. Um, Rob is here and Dave is going to um, join in as well in the conversation. But in a nutshell, um, you're right, Gordon. The guidelines for reopening schools encourage and recommend uh, um, using the outdoors as much as possible. It's just less risky for transmission of COVID 19. So when that recommendation came out, um, I reached out to Dave to see if there was any possibility that we might use some more space in the 17 acre woods so um, rob graciously joined dave and myself on a walk last week uh, in the rain down and through the woods and we were able to locate um well currently there are two outdoor classroom outdoor classroom um set up and being used pretty regularly throughout the school year one is the kindergarten space and they go out every Wednesday. And then there's a, a separate space that first grade has cleared and set up a little classroom um, and, a, and a temporary lean to. So we went down and walked the property and we were able to identify four additional spaces that are somewhat clear already. Um, in order to make them usable, we would have to um, hand saw down some saplings. And those saplings, our intent would be to use those to create temporary lean twos in those spaces, which are made out of saplings and, and tarps essentially, and used to keep supplies dry um, in the woods. So um, that, is, that is the request. Um, we are putting together, Curtis is, is helping put together uh, some volunteers that might join us in the 17 acre woods to create those lean twos if the board um, allows that, that use. And I don't know, Dave and Rob, if you want to add information to the discussion. So, so go ahead, Rob. Yeah, so um, we uh, looked at that space and really, I think from the Conservation Commission standpoint, whatever we can do to maximize the use of that property by the school we should be doing. You know, if we could get every kid outside every day, all day, that would be great. Um, so, you know, we're fully supportive of this. Um, I think that when we looked at the classrooms that are there, uh, they're all basically temporary. They're log benches and the lean tos. It could all be moved overnight if we needed to. So there's no permanent structure there. There's no permanent damage to the, to the property. And so I think it's a great idea. 
Um, Rob, I had a question um, sure. regarding the conservation. Is increased traffic going to be a concern for any of those areas in terms of erosion or the the soil layer, layer the leaf litter, stuff like that? Um, it certainly will be, uh, will cause some problems on the hill. There's, there's a stone stairway that goes down steeply from around the playground to the first level. That's the area that would probably be the worst impacted. Um, I don't know that there's much we can do to get around that other than put in the accessible trail that we've, we would love to try and get um, put in. But that's uh, that's a lot of money in a long term project. Christine and Rob, this is Phil. Um, I think following up on the point you just made, there had been a discussion about a grant to make that entryway more um, ADA approved and accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that still feasible or in the works or what's going on with that right now? Yeah, we, we do have the. Um the plan from Timber and Stone. It was finished last spring. And, you know, there is a plan to go forward, but it, it will require significant fundraising mm. to, to fund it in the tune of, I think, around $200,000. I think the report sure. um, estimated. Yeah. But yes, we, we have the site plan ready. Um, I, I think Mary O'Brien had a wonderful idea. Um, and I'll let her talk about that, but I, I just have, want to clarify um, a financial aspect of it from an insurance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Christine, if I understand it correctly, there's um, there's kind of a co-insurance going on between the town has a backup insurance and the elementary school has the primary insurance for, 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 um, for use of this area. So uh, Dave and I have been talking about that, and he is probably more in the know um, than I am. I, I think the town insures the property. The school has its own insurance, obviously, and we um, list the town. Our plan is to list the town as a – Dave, can you help me? <laughs> I always get the – I want to say like a rider, but that's not the term. As, um, an, as an additional insured. Additional insured. Yeah. Um, so that is the plan. I've reached out to the business manager um, at at our SU and haven't haven't heard back yet. But um, that was that was just last week at the end of last week. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think the like Rob. I think this is a very exciting prospect, and and Gordon alluded to it as well. I mean, we've we've gotten some great local and national coverage for what you've mm. done so far, and and. Um, you know, I think to increase the use is a, a wonderful thing. Um, Mary came up with a, quite an idea that um, I think might reverse the reverse our discussion a little bit. Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about your idea? Thanks, Phil. It's really um, nothing earth shattering. I just thought that the town could either gift or sell the wood to the school. So, you know, we're both municipalities or yep. municipal sort of government sort of agencies, and I don't know the, what legally would incur. I mean, it's still going to be within the town of Parkland, just a slightly different ownership. And and I assume, again, the, the questions of insurance then would become the town would have some sort of supplemental say. Uh, I don't, Rob, I don't know what the role of the Conservation Commission would be uh, at that point, but uh, uh but anyway, we, I think we throw that out there for for brainstorming and discussion. Well, from our point of view, um, it doesn't really matter. I think that we would be happy to help whoever has the property. Um, the select, you know, we don't have any power to do anything anyway, except through the select board. So. Um, it's really the select board's call, and if that's what you want to do, then what we do on the 17-acre wood, we'll do through Christine. We're happy to do that. I, I will just say um, how uh, wonderful that would be. I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, I love the partnership that we have with the town using, using the space, but if it makes more sense, um, 
for the school to to manage it, um, I think that would be, I think that would make things a little easier. Uh, I know sometimes we want to go down and, and you know, uh, just clean up the trails. And there there is that liability piece always in the back of our minds. Who's, who's liable if somebody gets hurt down there? And um, I think, you know, we're careful, but I think that would just, that would make things a little bit easier. Not that the town hasn't been very gracious in letting us use the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, if my colleagues agree, you, you know, maybe the next step is to explore some sort mm -hmm. of outline of ownership or just what that means. What does it mean to, to shift the of our ownership mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, um, um, and make sure everyone comes out in the right, right place? <laughs> yeah. Christine, I was wondering, can you also do classes on the playground? Near the yeah, school? yeah, we intend to, Gordon. We're we're trying to secure. Um, it's really really challenging. So whatever tents we can um, we can get our hands on, they're in short mm -hmm. uh, supply right now because all schools are kind of, are thinking about you know how they make school outside. So we are looking at that. We're really being encouraged to de designate areas to cohorts of classes. Um, when the kids go out for recess, we have to have a schedule because between each use, we have to decontaminate everything that kids potentially um, touch on the playground. So yes, we have, we're fortunate. We have space and we're working on where to put um, kids and, and cohorts of kids. Um, that's part of yeah. our plan. There are those grassy areas over by the woods too that are off the playground that might serve. Yes. Yeah. We've we've been looking at those as well. And and I did I did poll the staff. I mean, I sent an email saying who would be really uh, who would be interested in having a space out in the woods and I do have um lots of interest. <laughs> the teachers recognize it is safer to be outside and um will use the outdoors as much as they can. In in the winter time, your your experience has been good. Doesn't matter if it's cold. No matter the weather, the kindergartners and first graders go out every every week and they're out yeah. there for a good portion of the day. So we are not intimidated by the weather. <laughs> yeah. Um could someone fill us in on the history of 17 acre woods why is this a town property what what was the origin of it uh me i i, I am not the best person to do that but maybe yeah. robert or gordon would know robert gordon might know best yeah yeah well it belonged it was part of the martin martin property that Included uh, quite a bit of area uh, on towards Martinsville, and um, originally there was uh, a mill up in the midst of Martinsville, and then another mill site down near the covered bridge. And the land included all of the building sites that are along Martinsville Road. I think there are five, maybe now, house sites. So uh, he sold the building lots and the 17 acres was remaining. I think probably not suitable for development, but a great spot for classrooms. Mm -hmm. So he gifted it to the town. I just ask, I, I ask because I just want to be not be not not that I don't think this is a great idea. I do think it's a great, it's a potentially great idea, Christine and Mary. Thank yeah. you so much. But I just want to make sure we're not being cavalier with this yeah. land if it was intended for a specific purpose or something. Yeah, that make that makes sense, Curtis. And you know, I, I'll I will. I mean, I say this is a wonderful opportunity for the school, and I believe it is. Of course, I have to check in with my, um, you know, my superintendent and business manager as well to see what the, you know, what it would entail. As far as I know, there are no restrictions or constraints on the use. 
I think it was gifted because it was not much good for developing. And uh, it's at nobody was using it at all for quite a long time until maybe five or six years ago. Yeah. Um, just as a matter of interest, Mr. Martin was also the donor for the what used to be the library, the Martin Memorial Library, which is now the Historical Society. So there's a connection there. Uh -huh. And I think maybe his name was Ernest, but I believe it might have been his son that actually made the donation in the end. I'm not certain. Well, I think we can. Uh, is there any action on this, Dave? Are we? You should probably make a motion and some action that, um, you know, we look forward to working with the school to um, establish some some additional space yeah, sure. for outside education just so that it's on the record and um, you know it, it's it's agreeable and everybody is good to move forward and just just for clarity um, I think be careful about referring to it as the town forest because there's another property out near Katie Brook that's also called the town forest so if we can call it the 17 acre wood or something like that I think that that'll be clearer Okay. Thank you, Rob. It's a long trek over to the town forest from the school. And also, um, Dave, so what the motion you just recommended includes looking at it to develop it for outdoor classroom space, but not looking at any transfer of management or ownership. Do you just want to start exploring that with you, Christine, and the SU, or how do we go about thinking about that? as well i think you can maybe make a second motion um and that um you're open to um uh exploring the idea of transferring ownership to the school and that uh, christine and the town manager should work together to see what that would entail though though phil brought it up in this meeting i recommend that only mary be allowed to make that motion <laughs> So Mary, Mary can do motion two. I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at motion one here. Uh, I, I would move that the select board work in a collaborative fashion with the school board uh, or town manager and school principal to explore the additional use of the 17 acre wood for classroom, outdoor classroom. I could wordsmith the last part of it though, but. Uh, <laughs> That sound good, everyone? Wording wise? Sounds good to me. I'll okay. second it. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Nope. Nope. Okay, let's take a vote then. All in favor? Aye. Mary. Mary. Mary's in favor. Bill, yes. Bill, yes. In favor. Okay, that's unanimously <laughs> passed then. Thank you. That is. Uh, much a relief to me. So we'll get started on on getting some classrooms put together for staff and students. Good. Great. Hey, Mary. It's time. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion that the town and school work together to develop a plan to possibly transfer ownership of the 17 acre wood to the school with the caveat that if the school Ever closes the town reverse back the land reverse back to the school. Or to the town. To the town. I yeah. imagine any, any any sale could include riders. I think that's the correct use of the word yeah. rider. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Is that I, too much, Gordon? I don't know that the ownership's going to change. It may just be the control. Sure. Uh, should there be a school consolidation? So I oh, maybe no, maybe cool. Mary, I, I might propose that we could say transfer management or ownership. Consider transferring mm -hmm. management or ownership. Yeah. Leave it open to both. So I'm, I'm not sure just transferring management really does us much good. Um, I think that you would want to, unless it's you know, unless it's not the the two separate entities that I think it is. Uh, I think it's cleaner if the school is going to use it 
to the extent that it is, that the school ultimately take responsibility for that, both you know, managerial, financially, and, and from a maintenance perspective. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure there's really much reason to, you know, um, I, I'm not sure it really alters the, the landscape too much otherwise. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking, Dave, is this is really a lawyer question. Mm. We, we, don't, we don't really know the, how yeah. the ownership. Which is, well, I think the motion is simply that the, 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 the town and the school will investigate or explore the possibility yes. of transferring ownership from town to school. Yes. Does the half a trailer go with it, Dave? What's that? Does the half a trailer go with the transfer of ownership? Now that's a lawyer question. No, the, Rob, the Conservation Commission gets that trailer as a bonus. For, uh, <laughs> that can be your field <laughs> office. That is, that does become the field office. Okay, so, uh, can I uh, can I offer a second to Mary's motion? Yes. Okay. So we all clear? Yeah, I am. Dave, did you get that down? I missed uh, Actually, Martha is taking minutes based off the recording, so um, let's go figure it out. That, I think you may want to clarify that motion just a little bit, um, a little bit crisper. Well, I had dental surgery today. I can barely <laughs> stay awake, so uh, I will do my best. I make a motion that the town and school uh, explore the possibility of transferring ownership of the 17 acre wood from the town to the school. Perfect. Chris, that's good. Mary. Thank we you. We got you on video, you know, Mary. <laughs> it's not, I'm not on the, any illegal drugs. It's all perfectly, perfectly <laughs> legal. Uh, they all say that, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mary. Aye. Bill. Aye. Good. Gordon, Aye. can I add one yes. thing? I, I just want to thank Rob and his colleagues on the Conservation Commission um, for their work uh, for exploring the grant and, and just uh, helping with the school with where we are today with the use of 17 acre wood. So thanks, Rob. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Select board and yes. Thank, thank you. you. I'll see you soon. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to sign off. Yeah. Okay. Can I sign off too? No. <laughs> Bye, Phil. So, Phil, you were going to bring something up as good time as any about the uh, what, what Curtis is uh, trying to get right. information out. Curtis has created a call to the town to submit questions regarding the intersection. Um, and our plan was to, in the next few days, um, Curtis is going to collect those, collate them, and begin to sort of sort them into a set of questions, uh, identify the people that asked them. And, um, and then with the help of Dave, we were going to create answers um, to those questions. I'd like to take a moment to talk about where we're going to publish them. And second, if we could possibly create our own fact sheet to go as an addendum or with those questions and answers so that we make sure that um, things like tax rates and, and uh, little, the little nuances, which are all very important, are, are, are in one place. So that's what I'd like to talk about. and. Just was wondering, Curtis, if you had some thoughts and and um, and where are we at with all that? Yeah. So the um, the period closes today. I think if you if you were to think about this from a constitutional perspective, or maybe rather from the way larger scale governments do this sort of thing all the time, basically what this is is a public comment period. Uh, we, as a select board, we required of ourselves 
voluntarily the additional effort and attention to the voters and the taxpayers of offering a public comment period. That public comment period has been going for almost three weeks now, I think, and it closes today. As of today, I will be collecting all of the comments that were submitted either to the phone number or the email address in this public comment period, putting them together and giving them to Dave. I think I had promised him Wednesday or Thursday. I think the 23rd is what it was. But anyway, it's Wednesday or Thursday. Then Dave is going to compile the answers um, and will have those all answered by the 27th. On the 27th, those answers, as we as was described in the plan for this, will be published. Um, I think that should include the quote typical places, the post offices and mics, um, and should also have a copy probably at Damon Hall. Um, and then wherever else we want it. So of course, whatever document is generated will be emailed to the listserv as a PDF um, and could also be made available on the town website or something like that as as we desire. It's all up to us. So in that plan, um, Dave and I agreed and then the select board provided support for us getting those answers by the 27th. So that's the, the date that's coming up. Great. Well, I guess that's just a matter of information for things are moving right along on that. That's correct, Gordon. So, and and yeah. I, uh, Dave, I don't know how much person it's going to be do uh, you have a sense, Curtis, of how many questions or could I ask you tomorrow about that? Um, tomorrow I will have a definite sense. Um, I, it's, it's small enough that I will have the questions today well before I said I would have them to him, like I'll have them to him tomorrow or something like that. But I know just from reading the questions sort of as they came in, um, that there are a number of them that are repetitive, that are repeat questions, which is one of the main things this was designed to do was to serve as an efficient use of town resources instead of the town expending their resources answering the same question multiple times. We now have that question from four different people that can be answered all at once. So Dave can invest his effort into answering those questions into one time period and get really tight responses to the questions and comments that people have. A, a, a delicate point on that last thing you just said. Um, a comment is not a question. Uh, so how do we handle, do we just record the comment or? Uh, yeah, that was, that was my intention. Um, there aren't, there aren't too many sort of, I, I, will, I will tell you the nature of the communication to those official forums is radically different than the nature of the communications that's been coming in through not even an unofficial forum. It's not even anything affiliated with the town, which is the listserv. The listserv is associated with vital communities. It happens to serve our town. Um, and the substance and the tenor of the discussion or the what people are saying on the official forums is substantially different than what's happening on the listserv. And so the amount of sort of like politicking that might be published if we simply record those comments and, and publish them is actually quite minimal. So I would say, as, as we said when we, when we put this out, it said questions or comments. Um, I don't think we're, we're required to respond to the comments, but at least to remain, um, to maintain fidelity to what we said we would do, we should at least collate those comments and publish them along with the responses to questions. That's what I would think. Right. Okay. Um. 
I, I agree. Uh, you know, we just want to put everything out there. Um, and then the second area, which I was had been thinking about, is uh, what information may not be uh, drawn out by the questions that we would want to make sure that the general public uh, or our fellow citizens saw. Um, and, and that's why I was thinking of some sort of fact sheet. Uh, and and I, I don't know what others think about that. Um, <clears throat> Well, yeah. how, how would you develop, how would you distribute it, Phil? That's always the problem. Well, let's talk about whether we're going to do it, because I, I agree with you, Mary, absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, Curtis already raised that question about we're going to have this effort that we've done, but how do we get it out? Um, so, you know, if we are considering the places where we post meeting and meeting notices, as well as a general email to the listserv, that's a starter. So I think what you're proposing when you say fact sheet, it would basically be one page, bulleted items, maybe 16 point font, so you could fit maybe 15, 15 different individual facts on it, something like that, Phil? Uh, yes. Okay. So my primary concern with that um, is kind of a similar concern to why Clyde and the Board of Civil Authority and um, I guess the select board or something um, has agreed that the select board won't, won't serve um, at the election is that as a board, even though we might not personally be united, we as a board do have a vested interest in this. So I'm worried that anything we put out that's of our own initiative will be construed as politicking. Whereas the questions and comments that we've received are those that have, they've come from outside. So we're merely responding to them or aggregating them. We're not, we, that can't be construed as politicking. That would be my thought. Sure. Well, Curtis, I, I disagree with you a bit because we've already had a number of meetings where where Dave has gone through um, the various proposals. Um, so it's out there in the public, and I think we would just be, I hopefully, restating those things um, as opposed to uh, 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 manipulating data in a way that we we would want to present. Sure, but let me give you let me give you an example, right? Um, someone doesn't want the utility lines to be built. And as one of our facts, we say maybe it's a true fact that no trees could be planted if the utilities remain. But what we don't say is that any shrubs under nine feet could be planted. And someone who is advocating against the bearing of the utilities might construe us voluntarily leaving out that fact as politicking. That would be my concern. Valid. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, Mary, uh, Gordon, you know, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, well, that's sort of the gist of my little talk at the beginning of the meeting tonight. And and I just want to make sure that wherever the comments come from, that they stick to the facts and, and not. Um, I, I agree with Curtis, we shouldn't be making any us doing anything uh, political. We just, we, whether we, whether any one of us or all of us or however agree or disagree with this utility uh, burial thing is um, beside the point. We need to just uh, present information. I understand, but what if none of the questions asked what the ta new tax rate would be under both proposals? That's a fact. That's a fact. So what, what do we do with that? Not we, give it, it? we give them to them. And, and in fact, if no trees can be planted, that's still a fact. So uh, or here's what I would say. Maybe, yeah. maybe Dave, I, I, maybe I'm reading Dave's mind, but here's, here's what I would say. What, what we're doing, what we're doing now is actually we're instantiating an idea that was put to this board by John Bruno. And the heart of his concern was that if the if there are 
questions that people have about the project that also come up during the informational meeting, how can they get answers to those questions if there's some necessary response period? So the goal of this was to allow people to sort of ask those questions beforehand. But all of those, all of those facts, Phil, that don't get asked or questioned will be in Dave's presentation, I presume, um, on the second, second, third, third, on the third. Is that right, Dave? On the third. I I got it. Um, Curtis, I, I got to agree with you. The fact that I look at what the intent of this was. The intent was it, at the time, and this was, I don't know, like a month ago, people were just throwing out questions or, or there was questions with, with kind of false responses or, or not quite um, an educated response. And I think that the, the effort was to provide a um, an outlet for somebody to ask a question and that we would be available to answer it and the fact that we couldn't answer multiple questions during one day that we would accumulate them and take them and, and then kind of regurgitate it so i think that the effort here was to simply allow people to ask questions and have um you know essentially the town's response to what that question might be I think that's as simple as is what it was envisioned to be. Um, and um, it is tough to determine what questions we're trying to respond to. Um, I think we're just simply responding to what people on the on in the general public had um, that they couldn't find answers to previously. So I, I think my biggest question would be, Phil, um, because because this this you bringing it up reflects something you're concerned about some something in the process so what is what is the nature of that concern are you are you concerned that the presentation at the informational hearing at the public hearing won't be complete enough or what what's the nature of the concern i guess uh, uh access to the information uh that we are requiring people to uh fire up CATD, good morning after to, to listen to our all of our discussions and and get the facts out of that um, so uh, it's really access to information is my concern okay so what if um what if instead of anticipating those things and publishing publishing them ahead of time what if there was some sort of sanctioned summary of the of the information that was presented at the public hearing so that people wouldn't have to fire up CATV the day after. Sure, sure. I mean, you're you're uh, you're, you're arguing about the making sure that we remain nonpartisan and and, yeah. and unbiased with our presentation. And Gordon mentioned the same thing. Uh, I, I'm very aware of that, but I'm very also very aware that there are there was an awful lot of information that's been floating around and and a lot of that should be looked at by by folks and during when they consider their choices. So um, maybe that's the way to go. You know, that if we wait till after the August meeting and then we create a summary of that um, and and then go back to Mary's question about just distribution of that information. So would I'm I'm wondering would everyone kill me or would this would this be sufficient for you Phil if um, I took notes specific to that sort of stuff during the public hearing and then gave by blind carbon copy each member of the board the opportunity to uh, say I, I missed a fact or something like that and then distribute those after the meeting would that would that fulfill the purpose you're concerned about or because basically I took a, I took on this extra effort so I don't want to make anyone else really have any extra effort <laughs> so now that you're presenting this additional concern if there's more work that needs to be done to solve it I can do that work Okay, 
Well, Curtis, I would sort of say that's gracious of you, and, and I'll say yes, and that each board member should take it upon themselves to, to take notes during that session to sort of say, yeah, this is an important piece of information and make sure it's included in your summary. So am I hearing that you're delaying the, the uh, Wednesday report? No. No. No, okay. we're that's separating the two of them, Gordon. Okay. So basically what the proposal is, Gordon, is that from the public hearing, I will note the, the, the facts that are presented about the bond issue in Dave's presentation. And then um, in a blind copy, give it to each member of the board so they could give me feedback in case they think I missed something. And then aim on distributing that probably the, the day after. Yeah, I don't know whether that would serve a purpose more than listening to Dave's report over again. Maybe it's a condensed version, maybe maybe a little easier to understand or something. Is that the idea? Uh, Gordon, that's what I, I'm thinking, is that some people may not want to go climb into onto the ATP site and find find this meeting um, or that meeting and, and listen to yeah. it and sort of pick out the facts. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to go to the lowest common denominator here uh, yeah. of, of, you know, of ease as well as doing the right. Mary, Dave, what do you, do you think? Dave, do you have any concerns about that? I, I missed the last part. I, I can only comment that I, I think we're talking about two separate, almost two separate processes here, and I think maybe that's where you're going, but a, a fact sheet is kind of different from where we started, you know, in, in what we're trying to produce for Monday the 27th. Um, you know, a fact sheet could be, you know, somewhere on the the, list, uh, the website or something to that effect, but it, it's almost two separate work efforts. Um, almost wouldn't even try to use the two. Um, you know, I'd hate to bump anybody's questions because you feel it needs to, you know, you need to have a certain fact on there. Um, I'm going to come back to, we, we started off trying to respond to questions however many or little we got, and I think we need to finish that and, and not confuse that. Um, Dave, I think you're right. We are proposing these as separate work products. Yeah. And if you choose to take a fact, I, you know, I'm, I guess I've got kind of mixed emotions. I think it's a matter of how you present that <clears throat> and, and where and, and under what circumstances you put. Yeah, I agree. What do you what are your thoughts, Mary? Medicine, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I feel that uh, where there's good faith effort being put out there, um, whatever we put out will be a good product. But when there are readers who are not acting in good faith, it can be perceived as partisan or mis misleading or only present the facts we want out there so i i there, i feel like there's not much uh winning here mm -hmm. i mean honestly it kind of feels that way to me a little bit too we've just been ex excoriated on the listserv and it's just uh it's pretty disheartening for people who've just moved here in the last few years to to present certain things as fact and then have no idea what we've been doing or who we are and uh, that we don't have a dog in this fight. And uh, anyway, that's uh, that's what I want to say. Thanks. I think I mean, I. I am still worried, even even if I sat there and I was like really, really, really intentionally trying to think about presenting all of the information possible. It's hard, It any as, a, as an anthropologist, I feel comfortable saying that anything I choose to present as fact is a political decision. 
even if it's not, even if I'm not thinking about it politically, just because I see something as an important enough yeah. piece of information to include as a, a fact, that's a political action inherently. And so, I mean, I did, I did suggest this, Bill, as a way to solve the concern you bring up, but now I'm more antsy about it. <laughs> I mean, well, that, that, may be true. that may be true, Curtis, but as long as these facts we present are correct, I mean, obviously, if it's cost a million dollars, that's political, because who wants to spend a million dollars? But that's, that's just a fact. But what about People the nine-foot shrubs? What about the nine-foot shrubs, Gordon? What about if, if you deceptive, if you give only half truths, that's not, that might be political. I want to hear the whole story. We have to right. some of those. And that just got me scared, though, that no matter what I do, as Mary's saying, someone's going to say, and, and no matter what we do, because if we agreed to endorse this as a way of disseminating information, no matter what we do, someone could construe it as political simply because of the things we chose to highlight as facts or not they might call them half truths yeah. um, well but i was trying to bridge the gap between what questions were asked and what other pieces of information we feel are critical to know to make a good sound decision um, you know and and curtis i, I was involved in my later years of computing with um, you know these large data sets that everyone wanted to sort of search and you know if you were on the tail end of the data sets that I had and looking back at I mean students and the wealth of their parents from a giving perspective from alumni you know there were some pretty tedious mis mischievous things that were sort of going on that really was the responsibility of the young owners of the data to sort of, you know, chew the morals of how. I don't, I'm not talking about manipulating the data, and you're right about the interpretation of being political. Uh, we have to take the risk and put it out there. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. I think it's time to move on. So I do just want to put a point on what I said earlier. Actually, I want to totally reverse course on it. I de-volunteer myself from writing that fact summary of the public hearing because I just don't, I don't think it's a possible task. I want to wait to see uh, how I respond after we see the collation that you're about to do tomorrow and see what yeah, is missing. I mean, a lot of these, a lot, a lot of the questions that were asked were on point questions like what is the tax rate under the different scenarios things like that they're they're information that the voters will need um for sure i don't know for a matter of fact that it covers all aspects of what the information that the voters need but th there's a lot in those questions great can and Dave, can I ask a tiny, tiny question? Sorry, Dave, um, is there any sort of, will you distribute to the board any sort of like summary of what you're going to say or what you're going to present at the public hearing beforehand or after or anything? Uh, it'll probably resemble a lot of the June 15th meeting. Uh, perhaps minus the 1978 to, you know, <laughs> 2007. I think we'll probably pick up maybe with the, um, with the, uh, uh, the scoping study and then move right into, you know, the, the two alternatives that were presented to the board and then essentially financial data. I really got to, you know, one of the reasons why I did not get into, and I simply stated, you know, the CATV from a, a prior meeting, from trying to state this in an email is because how difficult it is to convey just that simple question. So in and of itself, with the present payback period, it's a different amount every year. 
So if you want to know what the tax rate is, it's a different rate every year. In my presentation, I gave an average. So I said, you know, over the 20 years, it's an average of about $65,000 a year, which is this much for a tax rate. Well, the tax rate is going to be higher in the first couple of years that we pay back and lower in the, the final. So you can't really put that in paper. You know, I guess you can in state in average, but when, you know, the tax rate comes out, if it passes and it's not that number, you know, someone's going to say, look, you know, you said it was, you know, 0.28 and it's not, it's 0.32. Well, it is, you know, the average was 0.28, but, you know, the first couple of years is 0.32. So I think you really got to be careful, particularly with these numbers, because these numbers, you know, involve, um, you know, things that have evolved and, and are in there basically, you know, a 15% um, uh, contingency, you know, you may not need 15%, you know, you can, you know, you may not hit it, but it's in there type conversation and therefore the, the budget's higher. But, you know, we ourselves as a group spent eight minutes just talking about that. Pat Dunn inserted himself into the conversation and it took up another five minutes just on that one topic of the budget of the project. So it's not, you know, you can put this stuff out there, but you need to understand, you know, the multiple questions that you may get just by trying to state what you think is a simple fact, um, but, but is somewhat elusive and really needs a verbal explanation. You know, I, I think that you can get come up with a fact sheet depending on what the information is that you want to present. But, you know, there's, you know, it, it's something that truly takes kind of a conversation and, and kind of an understanding, you know, to to understand it. And I think that that may be, that's why I didn't get into it um, on the listserv and said, you know, I spent an hour on this at a prior meeting, you know, for the best results, watch it in person because, you know, we spent 15 minutes on this. Um, rather than just spitting out some numbers that, you know, um, take some explanation to go along with it. And I will say the public comment and question period is still open today. So anyone who is watching this meeting, if you have questions or comments, please submit them to the website or call the phone number and leave a voicemail. We would love to include them in what we publish. I, I think it's also important. I mean, we put this together and I think it's important and it was useful to me. Um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that somebody can send an email or pick up the phone and still call the town offices. Um, I may not be able to, to get to them that afternoon, but generally I get to them in a day or two and, and kind of respond to some of this. Um, you know, I do see some of these Wild West stuff getting thrown on the listserv, yet, you know, um, only you know, less than five um, have, you know, essentially picked up a phone and called me from time to time based upon some of the postings on the listserv. I do get a question, is this correct? Is this in the ballpark? And I'll answer it the best I can in that short period of time. But, um, you know, there is still um, access to some of this information, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I, I, I'm not opposed to a fact sheet. I'm just, you know, just be careful that some of this stuff is not assured fired, you know, quick response. Gordon, okay. Did we, did we run that long enough? The lights have to come on now, too. Yeah. <laughs> can we can we move on? I'll move my a little bit. Well, I think we I think we've covered that, Phil. Yes. Okay. Dave, do you want any any comments about the uh, the pandemic that you want to bring up? Uh, yeah. So we're internally we're still um, doing you know acting on a fairly limited basis. Uh, Damon Hall is doing um, operating two three at a time. Rec Center is still doing summer camp, uh, getting ready for a limited basketball camp to essentially be just you know. Um, it won't be content or, or particularly games, but um, there has been something that we didn't foresee that has arisen that we've kind of had to deal with. 
Um, and I think that this will probably evolve, but at this, at this point in time, we've kind of put, um, we're not really not allowing it. Uh, and that is just uh, organized, organized parties or organized um, groups, for lack of a better term, whether it be folks that just want to do exercise, but in you know an organized group of 10 with kind of an instructor or, or something to that effect, um, something from that to a church group, to a musical band, to a somebody that um, perhaps would like to run for representative type thing. So it's very hard to differentiate. And to be truthful, we don't want to, um, if we wanted to offer some of these exercise groups, we would have incorporated it into the rec center uh, activities. Um, in the summer at least, and we'll probably have to think about this going into the fall. But um, certainly some of these other activities where the town really has no oversight or, you know, hand in the game, um, we have done our best to get the word out that uh, at this point we're not receptive to that. Um, we they tend to conjugate a lot where we have our summer camp and and um, you know a lot of the kids movements it is outside um, but again uh, this is just something we didn't really foresee and aren't really prepared to um, kind of manage so at the moment we're not allowing it it has ruffled some feathers but um, you know, again, I think we'll be patient, see what happens in the fall. I think that there may be room to put forth some sort of a policy on, you know, signups or or particular things that they would need to have to abide by. But um, I haven't completely absorbed that, nor have we really um, thought about that going forward. But it's just something that's kind of come up, and and I think that we will need to. Um, either continue to just emphasize individuals or, or groups of family or friends um, in small groups utilizing uh, the walking path or tennis or, or soccer. Um, but we'll need to give this organized group thing kind of some thought, particularly when they're not associated with the town itself. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there and let everybody know uh, we're kind of grappling with that. Otherwise, it's kind of business as usual. Um, we continue to watch New England do well, um, but kind of um, literally every phone call I'm on regarding this, everybody's kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll see what happens in the fall. And I think that that's kind of where we're at. So Dave, can I ask a question about the organized non-town groups? Yeah. What, what does, I don't know. This is this is all stuff I don't know very well. Not being a you know constitutional law professor, I wouldn't profess to know it very well. But what what rights do we have as a town, given the governor's declarations and the state of emergency we're in and whatever, to do things like uh, in, impinge on freedom of assembly or some or even I feel like that's a really like loaded term more loaded than I want it to be but do you know what I'm saying so it's no different than the governor has said sure you can have 50 people indoors um, however I don't particularly want 50 people indoors here at Damon Hall um, you could probably stuff 30 into the auditorium while they wait to see Clyde um, so there's an example there the, the, the state has allowed libraries to open yet ours uh, continues to do curbside. Um, I don't believe um, having town property would allow somebody to go out and do donuts. Um, so the town does have responsibility over its own property. Um, we have made a conscientious decision to take on the liability and to offer uh, a summer recreation program to 20 kids. Uh, we do that in a way that we can control and we can manage and we can oversee. Um, I can't say the same for an activity that goes on um, 100 yards away uh, at a different period of time. I, I don't know who it is, what's going on. 
They haven't provided any insurance certificate to us, um, any of that type of stuff. So um, we're limited, and in some cases, you know, let's take, you know, the Bone Builders was a perfect example. They were very adamant to use the front parking lot to the library. I was somewhat sympathetic for the cause. Um, however, they, um, as a group, as a Bone Builders group, um, have not been given permission by the social agency that oversees them. Um, and the insurance uh, carrier that generally um, provides insurance for them as a bone builder group is, is not there. Yet individually, as just Heartland residents, but the same group of people kind of doing the same thing, wanted to set up shops, you know, in the library parking lot. So, you know, there's a certain uncomfort level there, you know. Um, you know, okay, so you come over to us and our insurance and all that good stuff, and you know, you carry on. Um, yeah, you know, I, you know, would, you know, there's a part of me that says, um, you know what, exercise is good. You know, people need to get out. We should kind of promote this. But then again, you know, literally these, the, the number of people making requests because they can't go anywhere else. But our property is increasing, yet there's really no oversight by us as that what, you know, they could be wearing a mask, they could be separating, they could be doing whatever they're doing, but we have no, you know, they're not checking in, they're not doing anything like that. So there's a certain uneasiness, and I think that um, the town um, has the right, you know, again, if they want to come down with their dog and wife and walk as a taxpayer, that's good. As an organized group, you know, you know, doing something or, or you know, outside of the town um, purview and, and wants to come down. Uh, we're just, I don't think we're quite set up at the moment to kind of, you know, deal with this. Um, you know, it's something that we, you know, certainly didn't consider, but I get the feeling that they want to come to us because, you know, they can't function anywhere else. And, to be the catch-all location for activity, you know, during the coronavirus era provides a certain uncomfort level, um, particularly when there's really nothing in place to make me feel good that things are being, you know, done the way they should. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, Dave, than that? Or no, else? that's it. Okay. So then we could move on um, and talk about the budget update. <clears throat> so this is, we're getting farther into, uh, so this is still fiscal year 20 information. Um, it is, um, we're, we're getting and closing out the year as we move along here. So, you know, as we get through July uh, into early August, we should have received um, most of the invoices that um, we should be getting for anything prior to July 1st. Um, so these numbers are becoming kind of truer as we move along. In both instances, we are in pretty good shape. Uh, I'll stick with the general fund. Uh, and again, I'm going to try and stick to a kind of a 30,000 feet um, discussion here. If you got some detailed questions, you can you can ask as I, I move along here. Um, on the expense side, um, and I and I got to kind of remind you that the 21 house, the sale of the 21 house is kind of in, in these numbers. So you need to kind of understand that to kind of understand where we're at. For this discussion, I'm going to end up taking the numbers out, hopefully making that a little bit easier for you to understand. So for instance, on the expense side, we're almost exactly have expensed almost exactly what we budgeted. We're like 99.84. You know, we're like $3,000, $2,500 difference between what we budgeted and what we expended. But I think it's important to note that $149,580 of expenses 
uh, is when we paid off the note on the 21 house. So we did get 166,000 revenue, but we turned around and paid down the note. So we have the 149 expense. So when you're just looking at the expense side, that kind of throws you know a little bit of a monkey wrench into where we're at. So that leaves us with um, expenses of about 1,601,406, which is about 152,000 below what we budgeted. Um, that is obviously good for a budgetary point of view, but there's some things in here that um, you know we didn't you know expend on. Um, you know we've only expensed a portion of the you know front steps to the to to the rec center. Uh, and some other things, um, but nevertheless, um, that's you know from a budgetary point of view, that's that's certainly surplus is better than a deficit. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, we come in with revenues uh, greater than. Ex um, let me take that back. Uh, so when you look at this again, you're like, holy smokes, we're in the money. Um, but 166,000 of that was for revenue on the sale of the house. So if you look at the computer printout and what it says for revenue for the general fund, if you back out 166,200, leaves us with 1,804,265. Um, that's about 52,000 above what we budgeted. So the two of those numbers combined, um, you know, kind of give about a $204,000 surplus. That's all good, but don't forget we have delinquent taxes. Um, so it really depends on where the delinquent taxes fall. Uh, last we knew we had about $170,000 in delinquent taxes. So you can see where that gap begins to shrink a little bit. And, um, but the good news there is we did uh, the initial notices for the tax sale went out. Some of the heavy hitters have responded, and it looks as though there's an intention to pay, particularly that one big property owner um, in particular. So as, as we get some of those, it closes the gap, meaning that we have um, more of a surplus, um, which I think will be good going into next year, just you know, with some unknowns out there. And um, obviously, some of the projects that we needed to do this year going into next year, um, you know that we continue to do that and move forward um, so that's kind of good news um, on the highway side uh, at first glance it wasn't quite as good as um, I thought until I started putting the pieces together highway budget is a lot more difficult year to year to kind of um, you know piece together because We've got grant revenue coming in from projects that were from last year. Uh, that's a benefit to us this year. It wasn't good for us last year because we didn't get the revenue, but it's come in this year. Uh, however, if you go to page two of the highway, uh, I'm sorry, page one of the highway expense sheet, uh, under suburb maintenance, you know, we've got 20,000, 29,000 we've spent so far on the Mesa culvert. We won't see that revenue, you know, for a good many months. Uh, we've got uh, $7,200 in a better roads grant expenses that we won't see for a couple of months. Um, and this is all on uh, fiscal year 20. So that revenue, um, the good news is the revenue will come in next year. Um, it would be it would make this budget look even better if it was you know the the revenue came in as it was expensed but just know that um we've got some revenues on here from expenses that were expensed last year and we've got some expenses on here for this year that we've received no revenue for so the highway budget's a little bit more difficult to kind of absorb uh, that being said on the expense side um, we are at the moment, and again, as we move along and get invoices in, this could close a bit, but um, expenses are below what we budgeted by 33000 uh, On the revenue side, they are above what we budgeted by 40000 Again, a good hunk of that is some revenue that came in um, from previous year's projects. Um, 
which gives us a you know kind of a cushion of about 70 grand um which is about right uh because we didn't do sixty thousand dollars of paving um purposely um so that's we're running about right here i think that the bright spot to note here is that when we put this budget together revenues and expenses we just based upon the way we've done the budget over the past three years we anticipated using forty five thousand dollars of our prior year surplus um, to go against the expenses it was kind of keep the, to keep the tax rate down and um, i don't believe that we're going to need to use that so it is um you know money to utilize for unprepared um, things that happen, such as Clay Hill and Martinsville Road. So, um, you know, we've got a little bit to play with there. Um, so, but nevertheless, those projects are, aren't gonna be kind, so we'll need to continue to look at that. But at the moment, um, things are looking pretty good uh, on both budgets. Thanks, Dave. I wanted to um, uh, compliment the road crew on the W beam that was installed by Lafayette. Yep. It's it's a little startling to see, but uh, I'm sure I'll get used to it. Okay. It was, um, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I went in on Friday, I believe. Um, but uh, I do know prior to us putting it in, after we did that work, um in those trees being gone and and kind of the steepness of that um and it being wide open and kind of a curve there um certainly kind of made for driving you know kind of a dangerous driving condition that you know certainly seemed to need for for a, for a guardrail yeah i had to drive a guy into the ditch because he was driving too quickly towards me wasn't moving over i wasn't giving away so that's just those weed road fanatics that's all yep <laughs> i have no comment on that um, <laughs> uh dave uh, just a curiosity question on the general fund under the listers expenses uh the tax mapping is that a software cost that was budgeted for but but wound up being almost two grand more or is there a usage fee uh, we picked up, if I recall, we picked up um, some additional software. So they've been working pretty diligently on um, putting all your Worcester cards and your property information, for better or for worse, um, all your property information, including tax mapping and boundary lines, uh, on you know essentially accessible from the internet. Mm -hmm. And there was, they were, the software that they picked up um, allowed them to manipulate and update data essentially behind the scenes. While there was information listed on the line, they could continue to work on and update kind of behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. If I've got this right, if I don't, I'm somewhat in the ballpark. Um, but uh, I believe that it pertained to something very similar to that doug approached me with this um you know the response to him was the response to him was you know if you continue to you know balance your budget and, and stay within your means then um you know go for it and uh, he was able to do that okay great thank you is that it dave move along that's it. Okay. Um, I guess the next thing is uh, to look at the tax rate and prove that. And I assume we'll have to come in and sign that. Yes, we do need everybody to come in tomorrow to sign the um, tax rate sheets. So I looked at last year's. Am I right? It's about 20 cents more. For the town or for overall? No, just for the town. The overall, I'm not 
concerned. Uh, is that inclusive of highway, local, and um, county tax, or it's is that the bottom just, line? Right? Just the town. It's the bottom line: the homestead or the non-residential. Uh, so that no. includes. Yep, that includes the the school. Oh yes. Uh, excuse me. It's everything. Yep. Yes. So correct. And, and you're pretty good at this, but that's per $100 valuation. Yeah, yeah, okay. it comes, I mean, if it is 20 cents, it's, it adds about $500 to a $250,000 property for their tax bill. Is that, is that correct? Uh, I don't have, I'd have to, um, I'd have to, to do it up. Um, I didn't, um, I wasn't prepared to answer that question, so I don't know if I can do it right off the top of my head. Yeah, I didn't. It's uh, certain it's $500 as long as it's a 20 cents increase per $100 valuation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's quite a, um, I didn't, I didn't, um, I just looked at that. I planned to look at that the other day, and I only looked at it tonight at quarter past five. So it's not like I had a lot of time. And uh, so I didn't break it down uh, bet between um, the school and the town. So I don't know what part of that is ours. So the town combined, so the town, including the highway, including the local tax, which is your veterans exemption and the North Heartland Dam, and, um, and there may be one other thing in there, um, the Esquilet Bog uh, that is tax exempt. Uh, so the local tax makes up that amount uh, and the county tax. So if you were to add all of those up, uh, it comes to just, just barely over 56 cents. So the town is 56 cents and then if you look down at the homestead and then the non-residential the homestead school tax is a dollar 73 essentially a dollar 74 if you round up and the non-residential is a dollar 60 okay. if you round up so giving me that town report and what i said no on So while you're looking at that, Gordon, for the other members, just as kind of, I think we go through this every year. Um, so the tax rate really driven by two items. Um, one, the money that you need to raise, the budgetary amount. And then um, what the grand list number is. Uh, and on your sheets, um, the municipal grand list number is at the top. Uh, you see it as 4,496,708. Um, that's because the tax rate is per 100. If you were to actually look at the grand list or the, the, the overall assessed value completely in town, uh, the number is actually 449 million. Um, but the grand list is listed as 4,496,708, simply because it's listed as per 100. Um, so it's a, simply a matter of um, arriving what you need to arrive for a budgetary amount by the grand list. Um, so for instance, if you were to take the simply the town tax rate of 0.2898 and multiply it by the grand list number of 4,496,708, you'd come up with a number that's just over the 1,302,968 that we needed to generate for um, the, the general fund. Um, and then you simply, you know, kind of go down and, and do the highway, and et cetera.
think I usually have a nice little graph for you um, based upon the prior year, but um, I ran out of time last week, so. Yeah, if I, if I did the math right on the homestead, it's, it's a little over five cents on the town. I guess that makes sense. I mean, that's, so. I'll check that out later. That's 51 cents to 56 cents. Gordon is what you're saying? Yeah, it's, 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 it, no, it's, it's 5.19 cents increase on the homestead rate. If yeah. I, if I punch my numbers right. Okay. What's, what's the increase on the school side, which we can't? Well, the, the balance of about 20 cents. So theirs is close to 50, 14 cents or so on the school side. So Phil, last year, the homestead tax rate was a dollar 59, I'll round up 1.5857. Okay. This year it's when well, this year is 1.74 or 1.7359. About a 10% increase. Nine point six percent, I think, believe to be exact. Okay. Um, and we don't need a motion because we need a signature on it. Uh, we should. You should make a motion, and um, you know, Pat, you you don't, you really don't have a choice in the matter. You, you know, the grand list is what it is, and and you've already the town has already approved the budget. So right. this is just a matter of arithmetic at this point. Um, I do have, Dave, yeah. I do have one thing, though, that I think I would have to abstain from voting yes on this motion, as it says the undersigned board of selectmen on it. Uh, you know, I agree. Thank you, Curtis. <laughs> All right. I'm not available tomorrow unless it changes. <laughs> you know, history, history is just catching up with us here as we, sure, as, we sure not is. as we keep the same documents we've had for 15 years now i guess or like 100 years well i will be i will be very happy to make a motion to accept the arithmetic as presented given the change from select men to the select board met That, that's a motion. That, did not, that did not constitute a motion, but I will do that now. I propose, or I move that we accept the 2020 tax rate as presented um, with the change from the underside, undersigned board of select men to the undersigned select board. I will second that motion proudly. This is Mary. Hey, I don't think we need to discuss this any further. I think that sounds really good. All in favor? Uh, Bill, yes. Aye. Miss Mary. Yes, yes. yes. Aye. Dave, can, can, can you fix that, Dave, uh, in the printed version before we sign? Yes, or, yes he no? can. Yes, he can. can. He can fix yeah, it. Can. Now, <laughs> it'll be part of the town manager update, but we changed over the server. So we no longer have a server, so it's locked in place. It's it's forever. It, it, no. It's a template now. It's, it's a PDF no. template. Uh, Mary, Mary. Uh, I'll scratch it out and fix it. <laughs> I know. Thank you. You did the last time. And you know what, Dave? Your argument doesn't hold. We sent people to the moon. I don't know how, how long ago was that. You know, decades ago. You haven't done that in a long time, though, Mary. Yeah, you know, that's true. They were, they were trained professionals, man. We're just, you know, we're just, I, we're just hacks. <laughs> oh, God. So, so, Dave, I thought you were going to blame it on Amazon if that's where our cloud service is. So, uh, it's out there. It's up there somewhere. <laughs> we'll find it. One small step. We'll find it. Thank you, everybody. Okay.
So we'll, uh, when will you have that ready to sign it? Any time? <laughs> well, since we got to mess around with, you know, the cloud, <laughs> the, this warning here, I would give it to maybe nine o'clock. Okay. <laughs> well, you're up in the cloud. Can you get us some rain, Dave? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll mess around. We'll take the little metal poles and we'll do a little rain dance. Oh, yeah. right. it's cell coverage in town too while you're at it. You know. <laughs> okay, you got some notes for us, Dave? Oh, uh, let's see here. Bring it up. So I think uh, this has kind of made the rounds. Um, just as um, just as we're grappling with Martin, uh, I'm sorry, Clay Hill Road, uh, we did have um, a rather large issue also on Martinsville Road. Uh, we had a culvert fail. Um, essentially, the dirt fell into the culvert, creating a sinkhole in Martinsville Road. Um, this ordinarily would not be that big of a deal, you know, it would be kind of a culvert, you know, shouldn't say that because we got to dig up through pavement and we got to dig through a, a, a sidewalk. So that creates some complexity. But the culvert is about 20 feet below surface. So um, that does add some complexity to this. Um, in addition to the amount of asphalt and, and um, sidewalk that we need to pull up. Uh, that is in addition to Clay Hill Road, um, as we discussed earlier with Chuck Fenton, there's some good news there that the the culvert was not damaged there. However, we will need to shore up uh, that embankment on that side of the road. It's it's essentially a larger size weed road problem. So we will use um, two foot rock at the base to kind of build off of and, and build up from there. Uh, we'll need to have some compaction and, and also repave um, that little section of road there. Um, so, you know, it, there's some complexity there. Um, certainly not anything we care to deal with, particularly both at the same time. Uh, so we've got that to um, kind of overcome. Bill's working on um, getting that or entertaining some, some contractors for that work. Uh, in the meantime, we've been working with FEMA on the Mace Hill project. Last time I spoke, I was pretty disheartened. Uh, FEMA was giving us difficulty over the H and H study that was specifying 10 feet width, um, and we felt as though eight is about what we could fit in there. Uh, we needed to do a second H and H study uh, that proved that eight foot could fit in there. They did accept that, so we're moving forward. Uh, they do are, are still kind of bagging their feet a little bit. But um, nevertheless, the fact that it seems to have hurtled through mitigation finally after at least four months uh, is promising and that um, we can use the eight foot and not somehow need to magically shoehorn a 10 foot one in there. It did uh, not hurtle. It was shepherded, Dave. Shepherd. It was uh, shepherded. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I, I have... Uh, I have a quick question about the Martinsville and Clay Hill vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the surplus on the highway fund, which is about 55,000. Um, can we like, this really might be a stupid question and you're welcome to like slap me upside the head next time you see me if it's stupid enough. But like, can we do like deluxe jobs on those? those roads with that surplus or how does that work? So I choose to uh, say that we like to do things right. Sure. So we will, um, we are striving to do this work um, right and um, you know what we think will be effective. Um, whether that be considered, you know, I don't wouldn't say it's the gold standard, but um, certainly we would like to 
you know, and tackle this in a way that um, is kind of a widely accepted, you know, engineering practice to kind of put these back together. Uh, we have had some um, technical input from the Vermont Agency of Transportation on this. I got to say, I don't know what we've done in the past, you know, eight months, but they've been pretty good to us um, ever since the Mesa culvert went. So I'm grateful to that and grateful for their time. Um, so we, you know, we'll work off of that and see if we can, you know, get this done and, and to the, the, the way it should, you know, expect it to be, I think is kind of the way I like to put it. Um, so we're moving ahead on Mace Hill. Uh, we continue to um, move forward with that um, and can kind of keep our fingers crossed that FEMA follows along. I do have it as um, future agenda items. Uh, I still have a um, anticipation note uh, on future agenda items. Perhaps the August, I think it's the 17th meeting or, or before Labor Day, um, kind of right before that would get done. Um, you know, again, that would be anticipation of FEMA funding coming in. Um, whether or not we need it at that point in time, you know, I think that the thought was is, you know, the first tax um, billings come in the second Friday of September. So depending on when they start work and the billings come in, uh, tax uh, cash flow could be kind of thin. Um, if there is an effect from the coronavirus, I would expect to maybe start to see it at that point in time. Um, so, you know, just to ensure that we get the um, tax revenue in that we're expecting. Um, Plus, you know, it is going to be 160 grand out, which would affect any cash flow. So we're prepared to have an anticipation note in place. Curtis, you asked like six weeks ago, you know, kind of off the cuff, um, what an interest rate might be. Um, I guess the days of less than 1% are long gone. Uh, I think it's hovering about 2.5% at this point in time. Um, just to kind of give an update on that. Um, we've been working with uh, Mascoma, who is our bank, um, on that um, and um, a municipal lease on perhaps the bucket loader. Uh, and the bids come back on that July 30th. Is that so that's a short term? That's the anticipatory note. So is that APY or APR? Because <laughs> that's oh. a big difference on a short term note. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? Is it 2.6% APY or APR? Um, I think it is for the 2.5% uh, for the year, I think. Um, but I'll have to double check the paperwork. Uh, okay. on that. I mean, if we need it, we need it. But I just, yeah. Uh, there is a, you know, it is um, strongly um, recommended that we have it in place. If we don't need it, we don't need it. Uh, however, if we need it, I would like access to the cash flow. Um, you know, once not excavating pulls up anchor and, and moves on and we get that nice invoice um, that we're not kind of sitting in the wind there. Because uh, the, the timing on when they're actually going to do the project is also a little suspect. Um, you know, it could be the end of August, it could be end of September. If it's the end of September and the tax revenue comes in as planned or as normal, then it could all be a moot point, you know, so. Um, and we can borrow it on it as we go. So, you know, we can almost end up um, if, there's a, you know, he does a certain amount of, if it's towards the end of, the tax, you know, again, we get pretty thin going into the second week in September um, from a cash flow perspective. So it's to say we're, you know, under a couple hundred thousand and we get hit with like a $45,000 bill before Labor Day or something, we can access it. And then, you know, if tax money comes in, we can almost pay the $45,000 back and then not utilize it again. We can almost utilize it like a line of credit. So we've got some flexibility there. and. Um, Again, I being a little conservative, but I'd rather have it at this point than, than not, especially the way the freaking project's been going. Anyways, excuse the excuse the, the language there. Um, is 
Dipper Highway uh, Recreation Center also had its uh, fair share of issues. Um, the Septic Center, we had to close uh, or cancel camp a week ago Friday. Um, there's a funky, Gordon, you may know the history on this, funky alarm system on that rec center. It kind of wakes everybody up in the neighborhood, but doesn't really tell anybody in general. So we tend to get a whole lot of emails and phone calls from neighbors of the rec center that there's some sort of an alarm going off and, you know, whether it be John, Bill, myself, whoever's the first person that can respond, we kind of get there. Um, there's both a fire alarm and a septic alarm. The septic alarm went off. Um, it was full. The pump was had malfunctioned. Uh, so that we that went off Thursday night. We had to cancel camp for Friday. Um, we did deal with it. We do have a um, pump uh, on the way. Um, in the meantime, we did pump it a second time just to be safe. Uh, we believe there's about a 2,000 gallon tank in there. Um, so we will continue to keep an eye on it. It can function as long as it doesn't fill up uh, until we can get that pump in there. Uh, we also had an electrical wire go out after a thunderstorm. Uh, Stony Electric came and um, did some patchwork there. Actually, I shouldn't say patchwork, uh, replaced the wire. Uh, that went to the kitchenette area. Uh, the refrigerator is in the kitchenette area um, that I think does house the kids' lunches and et cetera. So that was fairly important that we got that up to date. Um, generator for the fire department and highway garage um, has <laughs> we've um, been able to cross a fairly important hurdle. Um, the fire department did um, bring in some volunteers, um, Chet Pacho to kind of help oversee this and um, Nelson Bugby to kind of do some of the ditching work um, because some of the electrical wire needs to be ditched from the generator to the to the fire station. Um, the, the trip to the highway garage isn't all that far. Uh, Chet needed to sign a volunteer waiver, uh, much like we did for the cemetery committee folks, if you guys remember that process. And Nelson Bugby, I essentially considered a uh, contractor that was donating his time. Uh, I did have him sign a non-employee agreement. Both of them, you know, were kind of, um, you know, old school, um, balked at kind of the paperwork at first. We overcame that. Uh, so I think that we're on par for the generator moving forward. And um, hopefully we won't have too many hiccups there. Uh, I haven't been outside today. Maybe they came today. Um, I do expect the uh, Mason folks back at some point soon for the front of the um, rec center. Uh, they, come, they were there today, Dave. I don't know how long. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, and um, side today. I've been kind of in. In. I, I I take that back. Before the meeting, I ventured. My daughter is with me this week, so ventured to cook a few hot dogs for her before the meeting and make it back. So that's, I, I fibbed. I, I have seen some of the daylight, but prior to that, I hadn't been outside other than like Cumberland Farms coffee on the way to work today. Okay. <laughs> so that's all I got. Okay. Um, anyone else have anything? Um, Dave, can I ask you, are there any updates on Clyde's search for an assistant clerk? Uh, I believe he is interviewed too. Um, I believe he was approached by a third uh, about the job. Now, I think there was some discussion amongst them. I don't know if you call that a, a direct interview. Um, I approached him as to where he was and how, where his thoughts were, and um, he told me he was hoping to have some sort of indication back to us or some sort of update by maybe the end of July. Okay. Um, Gordon, if you know anything better or Pat does, I, I personally get the feeling it has stalled a bit. <laughs> Uh, I'll inquire. I, I don't. I will ask. Yeah. 
And then I do want to, just for my own edification, what's going to be the process with Doug? I know Doug's really been a linchpin there at Damon Hall in the Lister's office for a long time. Yep. So, and and Stacy's online here, um, but um, oh, Stacy, <laughs> I have uh, I I haven't really had. I've, I've sat down. Um, it took me like a good week just to um, kind of get to a place where I could get in and talk to Doug, and you know, just kind of mention I really enjoyed working with him. And um, we had kind of a, a brief discussion on where um, we think that um, we can go with this. Um, what I can strongly say is that Stacy has been working um, alongside Doug now for, I don't know, two years um, at this point in time. She was kind of an, uh, an integral piece to the uh, reappraisal. So I think that we'll look pretty strongly at um, Stacy as far as perhaps picking up the ball and, and going forward. I think the delicate part of this is um, um you know we did up stacy's hours um a little bit um you know earlier in the year um along with doug so what we're gonna need to do essentially is bring somebody on to kind of overlap here um with doug and stacy you know craig is kind of in the background a couple hours here and there but we're gonna need to bring somebody in uh, to have an overlap with that group. And that's probably uh, the way I see it. it's going to create some budgetary pressures. Uh, I think we'll need to manage that. Um, you know, I think that the Listers have been um, star, well, I shouldn't say star, they've had a good budget, but um, they have picked up slack for other departments, particularly about two years ago when we um, were had some real expenses in the finance department as we kind of went through some change over there. Um, the Worcesters kind of got starved during that process. So I think that we're still, we're just going to need to kind of find a way to, you know, make that transition and somehow bring in somebody that's going to probably pick up hours similar to what Stacy's working now. And then perhaps, you know, look to Stacy to essentially do what Doug's doing at this point. Isn't this a really delicate balance because these are elected positions? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it is a little bit of a balance. Uh, however, um, and we can, we will advertise this. Um, so the preference would be to advertise it, but essentially it's an elected position unlike anything else. Um, you know, you have an elected official leaving at a particular time and you fill the gap until the next election. Um, I suppose in this instance, there's a little bit of a danger that the person running um, or not running, but the person that gets named as a lister um, and is looking at those hours uh, and goes into March, um, potentially somebody else runs um, against either, you know, any one of them. And we kind of start fresh. But um, my gut feeling is that if there's um, if there is not an opening, I would I would it's not like we've got an, an abundance of people knocking down our door to do this job, um, which is why I think that we kind of need to um, recognize what these folks do and the importance of the revenue side of our essentially our enterprise. Um, we can't operate without that revenue, and they are responsible for that. So I think that um, in, I think actually starting with Bob Stacy and Doug, there was some recognition to where, um, and Gordon and Mary, you can maybe add to this, it predates me. But I think there was some recognition on, um, and Bruce um, was involved in this. Um, you know, they, Doug and Bruce worked pretty hard. They brought in some consultants and um, they upgraded the IT or the, the computer functionality in there. And um, I think that between those that those two years and then the two years since or three years since, I think that they've come a decent ways and I think that it needs to continue to grow. But I think that we need to recognize that. 
um, and just make sure that the people that are there are are happy enough to stay, so that we don't need to. It's a lot like the you know it's a lot like the finance and the treasurer. Um, you know these jobs are really complex, and to simply find somebody that's willing to do this via the election is just a very you know you know there is. Um, I do believe that the select board at this point in time can look at making the changes to some of this being appointed. But um, if we stick with the election, it's just important that those people that are willing to do it um, and have put the time in to learn this stuff and to understand it and can defend it, I think is um, a real integral part of what we do and we need to carry that forward. Yeah. I mean, Stacy is- reminds that she's not up for re-election for two years, but Craig only got a one-year appointment, so we'll actually have two open positions in March. Just, you know, I'm going to send you over to his house like the night before. He needs to remember to put his paperwork in next time, so. (laughs) I will. I think that's kind of a prime example of um, kind of what we're working here with, but. Okay. There is some delicacy there. Um, but I think that um, hopefully we can we can work with it. Well, Dave, I would just add that you're absolutely right that there was a quite a transition over the last ten years or so of moving toward more professionalism with the listers, and uh, which has been has worked out really well, and we have done that at the same time that we've maintained a local person as Lister, which I think is very important. And so that that combination um, may be difficult to replace, but that's kind of where we're at. Well, at the very least, we have Stacy, who, yeah. who is persisting with her yeah. great work. So I think that that will probably become a fairly, um, you know, we'll probably that'll become some budgetary discussion as we move forward in that process. Um, you'll probably kind of hear how that's affecting things as we go, but um, I don't see another way to deal with it, to tell you the truth. Um. Okay. If we're done, um, I would entertain a motion. I'll make the motion that we adjourn. I'll second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. This is Mary. Aye. Aye. Curtis, I let Mary get a drink for her Percocet, <laughs> whatever she has. <laughs> so, yes. well, thank you, everyone. It was a good meeting. All right. Yes, thank you. Thanks for all the Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night.